Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I am your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 10, May 24th to May 30th, 1861. Last week, we talked about some early naval actions of the war in the Chesapeake Bay, as well as North Carolina, uh, putting the final piece of the Confederate puzzle together and had a very nice talk about Zouaves as well. We mentioned Elmer Ellsworth, as well as his importance, especially early in the war. This week, we have a few things to go through before we get into our talk about motivations uh, as to the soldiers. There are a few light events, all right? And then actually, we're going to close out with a little discussion about Uh, firearms of the war as well. But first, before we get into that, I did want to mention we have uh, our first piece of modern news, I suppose we can say, about the Civil War. Um, Recently, uh, as of the recording of this episode, uh, there was a movement to repeal the state song of Maryland, Maryland, My Maryland, which we talked about uh, fairly recently. So uh, there you go. Uh, We have some some actual news here that uh, goes back to the Civil War there. Um, now, I'm not going to say that uh, it was so, you know, was very uh, recent that we talked about that on an episode, and now, now the you know, repealing is happening. I'm not going to say that those two things are correlated, but you know, I'll let everyone's imagination run wild there. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the episode, and we will begin with the Bluegrass State. As a note, this is going to backtrack just a little bit when we're talking about Kentucky. On May 20th, 1861, the border state would declare their neutrality. Rather than side with one or the other, they would hope to watch the situation play out uh, without real involvement. Considering this is the home of the great compromiser himself, Henry Clay, that's not really surprising, right? John Crennan who had become the main political leader from Kentucky and had also made an attempt uh, at compromise uh, early when a couple of the southern states were seceding, and he tries to uh, take a stab at the compromise, but uh, it does not ultimately work. Uh, He had actually suggested the line of the Missouri Compromise be extended all the way to the Pacific, so that would have all that territory in the southwest. Um, They would be slave states, so placate those southern territories. Under that proposal, Congress would not be able to abolish slavery in the future territory or in the existing states. An interesting concept, but many states who had already seceded were unwilling to turn back. Neutrality for Kentucky did not hold either, and later in the year, they would join the Union. Now, Kentucky was indeed a slave state, as already mentioned. Many people, uh, like Henry Clay, had been born in Virginia and moved into Kentucky, Uh, the territory having once been part of Virginia. Despite these deep southern roots, though, being so close to the northern states would also uh, have an economic advantage. This is a good spot to mention, an attitude that would be shared amongst the strong Unionist border states. Many who do not want to secede from the Union would believe that the Constitution would save the institution of slavery. Like we have already mentioned, there are those who are still wanting a compromise, and a peaceful solution. Lincoln, in his inauguration uh, address, he, he mentions that he does not have the legal right to interfere with slavery. We talked about that already, so you know, certainly there is uh, a strong uh, footing for that uh, legal argument that uh, it's not going to go away um, in that manner. Not throwing a lot in with either side would appease the slavery supporters and the unionists of the state. As mentioned, This is going to change later in the year, and uh, we are certainly going to be there to talk about it, Uh, but just important to at least introduce this concept. And uh, I think it will also illustrate the split decisions we have been seeing in in various areas, the border states, you know, even states north and south. uh, It illustrates that, that divide that we have. An episode or two back, we talked about uh, habeas corpus and Lincoln's suspension of the institution. We also talked about the response of Maryland to the movement of Union troops through the state 
uh, mainly that there were, uh, shall we say, objections to that. Native Marylanders would destroy bridges and telegraph lines, as we already mentioned. One such man, John Merriman, would be arrested on May 25, 1861, uh, but not charged for his role in the destruction of the lines. While imprisoned in Fort McHenry, Merriman would petition for a writ of habeas corpus. Essentially, he was attempting to fight what he thought was an unlawful imprisonment. The commander of Fort McHenry uh, would not release uh, Merriman uh, under the pretense that his orders came directly from the president. Lincoln had given these orders to the army directly. Roger Taney, our friend from the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, would grant the writ and issue the orders for Merriman's freedom. The U.S. Marshal was turned away at the fort. Taney would consider Lincoln's action illegal, but the issue was not pressed. Congress would meet in a special session and pass legislation that would make any of the actions of the Army or Navy as commanded by the President to be considered as if they had been approved by Congress. It should not surprise you to know that Roger Taney did uh, send luxuries to Merriman while he was jailed, um, You know, as, as if you really needed to know his thoughts on the matter there and whose side he was really on. So far, we have talked about militias and men forming into regiments, but we should go a little bit deeper. When we talk about motivations of soldiers, I think we need to differentiate between why and what. There is a why as to the enlistment of soldiers, and then there is what in terms of what they believe they were fighting for. To really understand, I think we need to put our mindsets back in the 1860s. Back in those days, there were many different concepts that might seem foreign to us. A loyalty to your home, and most notably to your state, uh, was important. Today we have this concept of the nation as a whole, but this was not you know, quite so well developed back in the 1800s. Remember, 1776 at this point is less than 100 years prior. We are still a young nation even today, so ties to the nation as a whole might not be so strong. Sure, there was nationalist sentiment, but when soldiers mentioned defending their country, a lot of times they meant Virginia, North Carolina, etc., their states. Uh, that was what they meant by their country. Forging of a new nation, such as the Confederate States, would be a powerful motivator, so it is not to say that nationalism is not present. The bond to community would be stronger, and so you would be more willing to fight in its defense. There is a different mentality when it comes to manliness and this defense as well. Men starting wearing beards, the ultimate talisman of machismo. We have actually already mentioned that there was peer pressure involved in the enlistment of armies. It is not a Civil War example, but if you have heard of the book or the films uh, The Four Feathers, I think this gives a great example of this attitude. If you are unaware, the plot is that a British officer resigns his commission before an expedition to the Sudan. Three of his friends and his fiancée send him white feathers, a symbol of cowardice, causing him to have to redeem himself uh, by actually going uh, going anyway, not, not as part of the army. Now, we might today say, big whoop, white feathers, who cares? But if we think about this different manly attitude, then it makes all the difference in the world, really. We talked about how Henry Morton Stanley was sent women's clothing when he did not join up. It's the same kind of thing. Uphold honor, and there was duty to go out and fight and serve. These are both very powerful in answering our question of why should also be noted that there were also substitutes, you know, bounty men, draftees, and conscriptions that were not sharing the same reasons as to why they thought, but I will cover those another time. Let's talk about the what. James McPherson has written a small, concise book about what soldiers fought for. I think the great thing is that in this book, there are a lot of quotes from Civil War soldiers. The best way to understand motivations is by reading the words that they wrote. Both sides will show a strong theme of liberty as what they are fighting for. Freedom, in a comparison to the Founding Fathers, is interesting for the Southern what that they are fighting for as well. I find one very powerful quote interesting. 
We should be proud of that noble name. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and Light Horse Harry Lee were all rebels. Our martyred savior was called seditious, and I may be pardoned if I rejoice that I am a rebel. There's also another one this time uh, from a Union soldier. Our fathers made this country. We, their children, are to save it. And you should experience a laudable pride in the part of your husband and brothers are now taking to suppress the greatest rebellion the history of the world has ever witnessed. Why denounce the war when the interest at stake is so vital? Without union and peace, our freedom is worthless. Our children would have no warrant of liberty. If our country be numbered among the things that were but are not, of what value will be house, family, and friends? I also like this quote from an Irish-born soldier, uh, which sort of expands that the concept of liberty can be uh, something that is a sentiment toward you know even your foreign-born soldiers. So uh, here is actually a member of the Irish Brigade that we have mentioned before. This is my country as much as the man who was born on the soil. I have as much interest in the maintenance of the integrity of the nation as any other man. This is the first test of a modern free government in the act of sustaining itself against internal enemies. If it fail, then the hopes of millions fall and the designs and wishes of all tyrants who succeed the old cry will be sent forth from the aristocrats of Europe that such is the common lot of all republics. Irishmen and their descendants have a stake in this nation. America is Ireland's refuge, Ireland's last hope. Destroy this republic and her hopes are blasted. Union soldiers in the writings of Confederates are often depicted as an evil, greedy horde invading the southern states. And we, we mentioned the defense of the community and the home and how that was a powerful motivator. As the war drags on, uh, the most of the fighting is going to be uh, in the southern states. There is also a common theme of revenge. So here is another quote that sort of illustrates that. In this particular quote, uh, a Texas officer is writing his wife, and he is saying that they need to teach their children a bitter and unrelenting hatred to the Yankee race that have invaded our country and devastated it and murdered our best citizens. If any luckless Yank should unfortunately come into my way, he need not petition for mercy. If he does, I'll give him lead if he asks for bread. I intend to massacre the last one of them that ever has or may hereafter place his unhallowed feet upon the soil of our sunny south. So, you know, definitely teach him right. Start him early, right? We have already mentioned the horrible conditions of Andersonville, and, and certainly there were some who were sympathetic to uh, prisoners on both sides. Um, but I have another quote that sort of illustrates um, certain sentiments that uh, were not quite so charitable, shall we say. Uh, and this is actually a South Carolinian who is writing uh, while watching Union prisoners who are being transferred from Andersonville to, to Florence. I never saw a worse-looking set than the Yankee prisoners. They have all wasted away from starvation and are fortunately dying rapidly. That is much better than exchanging them. And I was talking about yellow fever, he also says, if it only gets among those 15,000 prisoners encamped on the race course, it will make them beautifully less. Now, slavery is an interesting topic. Uh, many of the northern soldiers were not abolitionists, nor was that a reason they would originally fight. But to witness the institution in person was a changing factor. Emancipation was seen later in the war as something that would destroy the southern cause and was welcomed by many soldiers. In the election of 1864, most of the army will vote for Lincoln, whereas perhaps they would not have earlier in the war. Here's a quote expressing the change in opinion. I thought I hated slavery as much as possible before I came here, but here, where I can see some of its workings, 
I am more than ever convinced of the cruelty and inhumanity of the system. So there were a lot of writings like that, for sure. You know, it should be noted that really the the goal of the North, the goal of, of you know, these, these states who stay in, in the United States um, is that they are trying to reunite <clears throat> the nation. They're not trying to uh, necessarily... Uh, uh, create a new nation or destroy these these southern states um so a lot of them are really seeing uh slavery as sort of being in the way of that and sort of a means to the end um so when a lot of uh folks talk about how the war was fought over slavery you know that was that was not really as big of a goal um until it became you know seen as more necessary toward the end there the addition of black soldiers to the union army would also solidify some soldiers who would defend their comrades. Confederate soldiers who did not own slaves, and most of them did not, certainly wrote about racial superiority and a fear of their homes should slaves become free. I know we may bring up more motivations down the road. I do think it is important to understand the motivations, or at least some of the motivations, of uh, the common soldier as we move forward, and uh, it is not quite so black and white as uh, maybe certain certain things would make you believe. So there's sort of this complexity to everything. And it's not certainly something that we can just, you know, put a pin in it. It's going to be sort of ongoing as we go through this narrative. So, you know, we'll definitely, you know, keep touching upon it, you know, moving forward. Just a little bit about the appearance of these soldiers who have various reasons for fighting. In terms of equipment, there are similarities and differences of the dress of the two sides. Early in the war, there are more outlandish uniforms as well as a mixing of colors, which will play a part in the early battles of the war. You know, for instance, there are Union troops who are wearing gray and uh, Confederate troops wearing blue early in the war, so it does get a little bit confusing. The other thing that I think is sort of interesting, or at least I thought it was interesting, and it's something I never really thought of, is that you know Union troops would wear wool uh, mostly, while Confederates would wear uh, uniforms made out of cotton, so um, it's, it's sort of, it makes sense, right? You know, cotton in the South, uh, and obviously, you know, the, the North, they don't, they don't have cotton anymore, right? Uh, so, I don't know, it's just something that you never really think about, I think. While there were variations, you know, let's talk generally, though. The U.S. Army would wear blue sack coats over civilian shirts and drawers mostly. For pants, light blue trousers, and for headgear, a forage cap, or kebby with leather strap. If you picture the kind of blue or gray hat you can get at most Civil War gift shops, you know, that's what we're talking about here. Shoes would be leather with an iron heel plate. Confederates would wear gray or butternut, but the accoutrement would be relatively the same to their northern counterparts. Cartridge box that would contain 40 cartridges, a cap box for your percussion caps, we'll talk about those in a minute, who are going to prime the weapon, uh, bayonet, scabbard, you know, canteen, haversack, that's going to carry rations, your knapsack, that's clothing, personal items. And, you know, typically there would be a blanket roll for Confederates. You know, Union troops also use the blanket roll. And that's, uh, it's pretty iconic, I think, when you think of a Civil War soldier uh, to have a, a, a rolled blanket you know, around the, slung around the shoulder. If you place items in a blanket and then roll it up and then you sling that over your shoulder, you know, uh, tie it off before doing so, um, then you, you sort of have a makeshift uh, backpack shoulder bag, right? Uh, you know, a haversack was sometimes uncomfortable, so the blanket roll would be used, well, like I said, on both sides. As another quick note, the color of, say, the chevrons on your NCOs would designate the branch. Uh, so you'd see light blue for infantry, yellow for cavalry, and red for artillery. It's uh, sort of the same on both sides there. Let's move forward and talk about another topic that is uh, certainly uh, a nice topic for some, and you know, for some uh, it might be a little bit boring. That's why we saved it till the end. Let's talk about guns. Specifically, let's mention a brief history of firearms and explain a little about why the Civil War was so deadly. So that's important. In case anyone does not know, for this discussion, caliber when we are talking about guns, refers to the bore diameter of the barrel and size of the ammunition, right? So, in 1795, 
we would see the first production of American firearms. They would be based off the Charleville muskets that the French supplied during the American Revolution. Once again, thank you to the French. Now, these weapons would be flintlocks. For a flintlock, you have a flint, which is sitting in a little lock. As the name would suggest, it strikes a hammer. A spark goes into a pan, igniting the touch hole, which fires the weapon. So, uh, that's how that works there. You have three shots in a minute, usually, for a flintlock, you know, if you're well-trained. And we're going to see some improvements as we sort of move forward to 1816. The pan is going to be made of brass, which is going to have, you know, provide for less corrosion there. But, you know, wet powder is still going to be a problem for these flintlocks. Um, so we come up with the percussion cap, which made things a little bit easier. And one of the first uh, weapons that used the percussion cap uh, was actually the 1841 Mississippi rifle. And it was named the Mississippi rifle, not because it was made in Mississippi, but because it was used by Mississippi volunteers during the Mexican-American War, who were commanded by, uh, you guessed it, Jefferson Davis. Jefferson Davis wanted to have the cutting-edge armor mints for his men, so he you know, purchased these uh, percussion cap rifles for them. A 54 caliber 1842 Springfield you know, provided some further development, and we should talk a little bit about how bullets are, are developing, right? And the bullet is going to be, of the Civil War anyway, is going to be uh, named after uh, its inventor, a French army officer named Claude Etienne Minet. Uh, we see a lot of it, you know, mini ball is what a lot of people pronounce it as. I guess it should technically be Minet ball, right? Uh, instead, uh, it's slightly smaller than the hollow of the barrel, so the ball would expand, right? You're also using uh, rifling with this, so it's spinning. So it, it has a little bit more force to it. It can go farther, right? That's what uh, that's what that means. And your rate of fire, you have a nine-step process. It's called load in nine times. That's what it's known as. You take out your cartridge. You tear it with the teeth. You pour the powder down the barrel. Uh, you put the bullet in the barrel. You have your rammer. You know, it is rammer, and you ram down the cartridge. You return the rammer. Uh, you'll prime your weapon. You'll put your percussion cap on there, half cock. The, the hammer there, and then you're good to go, right? The percussion cap will then charge the powder that fires the weapon. You also could, you know, soldiers sometimes actually shot their rammer. Sometimes they forgot that the rammer was still in the weapon, which, uh, you know, did happen. So the whole process is going to take 15 to 20 seconds for your whole uh, load and nine times there. So you're also looking at about three rounds per minute. So if you, say, had 400 men and you have 10 minutes, then you're looking at 4,000 rounds, right? You'd have different, you know, variations in terms of the weapons. So you have uh, Sharps rifles, you know, who are going to be used uh, in Bleeding Kansas. We sort of mentioned that. They're breech-loading weapons. You actually see um, the first repeating rifles being used here, uh, uh, at least, the, you know, the first... Uh, on American soil, right? So you have, you know, your your Spencer repeater. You know, those are, those are the uh, probably one of the more famous. And you're starting to get early developments of the Winchester rifle, right? Um, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, yes, you know, sort of the uh, John Wayne uh, rifle, shall we say? You know, he's always he always seems to have a Winchester rifle in those westerns. Um, but anyway, let's keep talking about uh, the the muskets here. You know, you had your 1842 Springfield, which was a 69 caliber, uh, model 1855 Springfield, which used a tape primer, which is a little bit different, but, you know, we're actually still unreliable there, so we got to go back to the percussion cap. 1861 Springfield, it was a percussion cap system, which also added a rear sight, so we're always making these weapons a little bit better. You also had foreign arms, so, you know, Springfield, obviously coming from the United States, right? <clears throat> you know, you had uh, 1861, sort of a mad scramble for the Confederacy to procure arms, so they're getting a lot from uh, Europe. Your P-53 infield was coming from England. You know, a lot of uh, English rifles came across the channel on both sides. So uh, mostly, you know, Confederates are obviously benefiting from that, but they're also being sent to the north as well. The Austrian Lorenz rifle is also a similar uh, type of weapon. 
uh, and the, you know that's also going to be used by both sides too. We also need to talk a little bit about handguns, uh, specifically the Colt repeater. So you had Samuel Colt, who's going to invent uh, the repeating uh, uh, handgun, right? Uh, the revolver. Okay, and it was always said, you know, you, you, sometimes you hear this classic saying that uh, God created man, but Sam Colt made them all equal. So uh, that's uh, that's kind of a funny funny thing to say about Colt. Um, it's a household name now uh, because it was actually the first practical uh, revolver. Patterson, New Jersey, that's where uh, it was first invented. It was a 28 to a 36 caliber, you know, five shots. I know we usually think of a six shooter, right? But, you know, the, the first models, they only had five. Uh, and it was not necessarily uh, welcomed by the army, and uh, you know certainly with these, uh, the Henry rifle, which is the early model, you know sort of evolves into the Winchester, the Spencer rifle. Um, the War Department is not going to want as many of these produced because they think that it's going to expend too much ammunition. Uh, it's going to be a problem. Uh, men are going to not be aiming as much; they're just going to be focusing on just you know pulling the trigger, right? Um, so that's sort of their their reasoning why. They're, they're not really approving these. They don't want as many produced. Um, but certainly by in the Civil War, you know, the Colt uh, handgun, you know, the Colt Navy revolver as well is a, is a popular weapon. Uh, these are going to see a lot of action, uh, especially with cavalry and your guerrilla fighters. Your regulars are going to use these. You know, sort of mentioned that uh, eventually, you know, cavalry is going to evolve throughout the war. And sometimes they're going to carry two of these revolvers and they're not even going to carry uh, saber or uh, sword, right? It's your classic, you know, cavalry has a has a sword. They're going to get rid of that. That's that's no good. But uh, if we have two of these revolvers, it's definitely going to be uh, a little bit more effective right on the battlefield. So anyway, hopefully, I hope everyone stuck around for the gun talk. And that's going to be it for this week. Just as a recap, we talked about Kentucky, habeas corpus, and reared its ugly head once again. We talked about motivation and some equipment and guns for the soldiers who are going to be fighting. I'll try to post some pictures of the soldiers and, you know, I'll definitely try to post um, some pictures of these weapons so we know what we're talking about uh, to the website. So definitely check that out. Next week, we are going to talk a little bit about West Virginia and we will get another appearance from our old friend Benjamin Butler. So get excited. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, uh, the Patreon and uh, Venmo information, so your support for the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is appreciated. Any kind of questions, comments, concerns, what have you, uh, cwweeklypod at gmail.com. That's the email. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening, and you all have a great week. <laughs>